counting twice as much as the others. So it's essentially equal to 18 of them. So just be aware of that, that about 20% of your exam is coming from chapter 15. Okay, so um, looking at this chapter, this chapter we are going to be looking at intracellular transport uh, and compartments that are present within a eukaryotic cell. We are going to be first looking at our endomembrane system um, and the main membrane enclosed organelles that are part of that system. We are then going to look at those mitochondria and chloroplasts that are again membrane enclosed organelles, but they are slightly different than the ones that you see as part of the endomembrane system. We are going to talk about how this helps us sort different proteins to the various compartments, moves them from one place to another. Um, through uh, vesicular transport, through transport vesicles. And then uh, we're going to, in the end, towards the end, talk about various secretory pathways uh, that are present inside our eukaryotic cell to control this vesicular transport, as well as just transport of small molecules or, uh, or large molecules around our cell. Um, so we'll have two different ways that things can be moved around. One is the secretory pathways um, and the other is endocytic pathways. So we'll talk about those two types of transport systems. Okay, so to start with, uh, we are going to be first looking at our membrane enclosed organelles. Uh, so in a typical prokaryotic cell, the plasma membrane is enough, it provides enough um, surface to cell ratio for that um, particular cell to get all its needs covered through that plasma membrane. So the plasma membrane is the place where ATP is driven, where things are getting moved outside and inside the cell. It's maintaining the homeostasis of the cell. Everything can be done through that plasma membrane alone. But as the cells enlarged in size in these eukaryotic cells, they can no longer maintain that, um, you know, all the functions just through plasma membrane alone because many times these cells are essentially like 10, up to 10,000 times greater in size, right? So because of that, you had a need to create these internal membrane structures that can provide extra surface ratio, uh, you know, surface area to cover uh, the needs of the cell. And not only that, it also uh, allowed them to become specialized. Just like if you think about a multicellular organism, we have specialized systems inside our body that are specialized to do a particular task. The, uh, having these internal membranes allowed them to become specialized to have a particular task uh, that they are specialized for, that they can perform, right? So when we are looking at our endomembrane system or just membrane enclosed organelles first in general, move, me, move myself out of the way. Um, you're going to have, you know, obviously your nucleus, which is containing your genomic information. You have that enclosed by a double membrane. You have your ERs, right? Your endoplasmic reticulum. There are two different types, and we'll talk about what the function of those two different types is. Um, and then you have your um, way to transport molecules from one place to another through the Golgi apparatus and these endosomes that form as little vesicles that transport molecules from one place to another. You have your lysosomes um, and peroxisomes that are both part of digestive and uh, detoxification mechanisms, depending on what it is that you're looking at. And then you're gonna have your mitochondria and your chloroplast depending on, uh, you know, mitochondria alone or mitochondria and chloroplast if you're a plant cell uh, that are going to be driving your ATP production right? So those different organelles all require specialized membranes to do the work that they need to perform, right? Uh, so here, what you're looking at on, um, you know, here's just a cartoon of it, but basically it's showing you cell from the intestine uh, lining, and it's showing you how some of these organelles are going to show up in there in this electron micrograph, right? So you see the various organelles all interspersed inside this image. Um, you can see the nucleus and it's a flat image. Obviously the cells are not flat uh, because of the way uh, the image is taken. So if you look at uh, this table, this table is going to provide you with just 
a kind of an overview of the main functions that these each compartment inside the eukaryotic cell um, is used for. And it is obviously useful to uh, know these, and we're going to talk more and more about them as we go through the semester. Today, we are going to focus specifically on the membrane enclosed, uh, you know, uh, compartments that are inside the eukaryotic cell and how they function at a more uh, kind of overview level. Okay, so the cytosol is obviously where all the aqueous stuff is present. It's all suspended in there. It contains all your metabolic pathway related proteins that are performing their work. Um, and that is the site for your protein synthesis. And obviously uh, the cytoskeleton that's gonna be present within that cytosol will maintain the structure of that cell, but also it's going to keep these organelles in place too. It will provide an anchor point for them and also provide a place for them to move from one place to another. So the cytoskeletal filaments actually allow molecules to move, um, allow organelles to move, allow the uh, vesicles to move um, with the help of motor proteins sometimes, or just themselves um, from one place to another as needed. Then you have your endoplasmic reticulum that is going to be continuous with the outer membrane of the nucleus, as well as some of the plasma membrane. And what you're gonna have in there is, um, depending on whether you're looking at your smooth ER or the rough ER, they will have different functions. Typically, and we'll go more into that in a little bit, in a minute, your rough ER, which is studded with the ribosome, is gonna be uh, site for synthesis of proteins that need to move somewhere outside of cytosol. These are the proteins that need to be packaged and sent to the membrane, sent to other organelles, sent to do particular functions somewhere else. Um, and then your smooth ER is usually the place where you, uh, depending, it's very specific to the cell type that you are looking at. In the liver, it's used to detoxify the liver cell. Um, for example, any, you know, for alcohol or any other drug use that you're doing, that's where the site of detoxification. Um, in general, it is used for synthesis of lipids, as well as, you know, steroids and specifically um, cholesterol molecules. Then in uh, your Golgi apparatus, which is going to be part of the transport system, packaging system, you're going to have these proteins that were built in endoplasmic reticulum in the rough ER. They're going to be modified, sorted, and packaged according to where they need to go. Some of the lipids that are synthesized also move through this system to be delivered to their appropriate site, whether it is to the plasma membrane or some other membrane within the cell. And then you have your lysosomes um, that are uh, going to not only, did they have digestive enzymes inside them, not only do these uh, lysosomes digest molecules that come in as nutrients, but also they are a site to recycle your just kind of spent organelles and used up organelles. So when an organelle is too damaged or too old, it is going to get targeted into these lysosomes where it is uh, then kind of just used up and degraded into its basic components that could then be reused. Endosomes, on the other hand, um, so endosomes are one of those, again, vesicular uh, transport systems where these endosomes will take uh, in these organelles that needed to be uh, degraded by the lysosome. And as they move through the cytosol, they sort the uh, stuff to get uh, stuff from there so that some of this can be recycled and put back into the cell while others, uh, other remaining stuff goes into the lysosome um, to get degraded in itself. Peroxisomes are your, um, you know, uh, again, similar to lysosome in the sense that they are going to be part of um, degradation and detoxification mechanisms. And both peroxisome and lysosome contain enzymes and contain an environment that's otherwise hostile to the cell. So that's something that's similar about them, that both of them will have a hostile environment that would otherwise harm the cell if it wasn't enclosed in the special membrane. Um, lysosomes, like I said, were uh, degrading organelles and recycling those and uh, kind of doing digestion of uh, molecules. 
peroxisomes, on the other hand, are actually going to be where you're detoxifying material um, through oxidative breakdown. And it leads to hydrogen peroxide getting produced as a byproduct, which again, um, would obviously be harmful for the cell if it was just getting secreted outside. And then finally, your mitochondria and chloroplast are your site for um, how cells are uh, producing energy, right? Okay, so the first uh, thing we're gonna look at how these um, membranes uh, evolved, how did they actually come into being? So there are two different categories of organelles uh, based on how they evolved and how they uh, were founded to begin with. So the first one is your um, endomembrane system, as we call it. These are the set of membrane organelles that are essentially part or extension of your plasma membrane. They formed, if you look at the original cell, you know, back in the day, which was an anaerobic archaea, um, you know, cell, that particular cell would have no membrane bound uh, organelles. They would have a single plasma membrane. And as I mentioned, there was enough um, surface area in that plasma membrane to provide for all the needs for that cell. It would have had a still, you know, kind of concentrated area where all the DNA was housed. It would have had areas where you would have seen membrane bound ribosomes doing the work they need to do as they made proteins to be put into the plasma membrane or secreted outside. Uh, so all that stuff was done in the same uh, membrane. As the cell grows in size, however, it can no longer perform those functions effectively with just that single membrane outside. So what uh, probably started to happen was the invagination of this plasma membrane to kind of sort of create these enclosed environments. Initially, it would have been a partial invagination. So it was just partially kind of separating out the DNA area uh, from the rest of the cell, the ribosomes from the area as well. However, as it developed over time, they caused a complete separation of these internal membranes. Um, you can see that in the nucleus that you end up with a double membrane um, in that final nucleus structure. It's not a single bilayer, but a double bilayer because of the way they would have invaginated. And you can see that happening right here when it's done in a partial manner. Now, these uh, two membranes, so we already have a hard enough time getting molecules into the cell when there's a single lipid bilayer, right? It's very um, specific on what it will allow in and out. Well, when you have a double membrane, now it's gonna be even harder for molecules to get in or out, right? So that creates a very tightly regulated environment inside the nucleus to maintain the integrity of that precious DNA code that we have, the information, our recipe book that we have inside. Um, now, you still need to get things in and out though, right? So you still need to have some way for molecules to be moving in and out. So you're still gonna have some transporter proteins and we'll talk about some of those. But in addition to that, what you have are these specialized pores within the nuclear membrane um, that go through, that pass through that entire double membrane layer, right? So it, they allow, they are the primary um, way that molecules are going to go in and out, proteins are going to go in and out of the cell as needed, are through these nuclear pore complexes. Now, outside of the nuclear membrane, you see that extension continuing on, creating these enclosed environments. And these enclosed environments are what we know as endoplasmic reticulum. And again, some of these are gonna be studded with these ribosomes for protein synthesis. That's gonna be your rough ER. While the other side is, you know, you see some, usually a minute, you know, majority of your endoplasmic reticulum is gonna be like this. It's gonna be studded with the ribosome, but there will be a portion of it that's not, and that's called the smooth ER. Um, now, in addition to the, endomembrane system, this system, basically, you know, the system that goes from the plasma membrane to your endoplasmic reticulum, um, the nuclear membranes, and then the transport vehicles. So all the Golgi complex, the little vesicles that form from it, that invaginate from it, those all are called the endomembrane system. And we're going to see that again, term again in a minute. 
In addition to that, you have these two separate kind of organelles that are hanging out that don't really communicate or interact as much with this main um, you know, uh, membrane enclosed organelle system. So lysosome, peroxisomes, endos endosomes, all of those are always interacting with each other. They're always talking to each other. They are getting signals. They're getting molecules transported between them. But then you have these mitochondria and chloroplasts that kind of stay outside the system. They kind of hang out by themselves. They do their own little thing to the point that they have their own little genomes. They can make their own little proteins. They have their own ribosomes. So be, those systems are obviously somehow different than this main nuclear endoplasmic reticulum, you know, endomembrane system complex. So the mitochondria and chloroplast, as we discussed in the very, very first chapter, come from a slightly different, evolved through a slightly different method. Again, the idea is that you had these cells that were somehow now merged with the plasma membrane and kind of engulfed by it and became part of the um, eukaryotic cell. But these cells at one time used to be either an archaea or a bacteria. They were some form of a prokaryote that got engulfed by the plasma membrane of the cell of this new anaerobic eukaryotic, early eukaryotic cell. And now it had additional capabilities. It had capability to produce energy at a much larger level through the help of mitochondria. It had the ability to make its own food using the chloroplast uh, photosynthesis method. And that uh, is what uh, we have talked about as our endosymbiont theory before. Um, and that is how we think that these molecules have come to be. Any questions about that before we go into protein sorting? So like the cell find uh, existing mitochondria like favorable that way? Like she start to, uh, the cells start to have energy easier? So probably what happened was that, you know, it's again, it's kind of a little, uh, you know, uh, something that we see happening in many organisms at a more uh, micro level even today, right? Some organisms can live with each other in a symbiotic way, right? And so in this case, it probably started off with that kind of symbiotic relationship, eventually ending up where mitochondria lost its ability to live by itself all by on all on its own. So the prokaryote initially, right, was a living cell that could live on its own, that could divide, that could do everything it needed to do. It really didn't need the eukaryotic cell for anything. It was probably ingested as, you know, if you uh, call it, it was engulfed for ingestion, for digestion, for energy source uh, by this anaerobic eukaryotic cell. But when it engulfed it, it ended up forming this membrane, one membrane around it, and two, not ingesting it as it started to produce higher amount of energy through whatever was present there. So over time, it would have obviously become a favorable condition for this cell. So it ended up creating um, this relationship long term, eventually where the prokaryote lost its ability to be on its own completely. And now it's just part of the eukaryotic cell as a mitochondria. So in this process, it would have um, degraded that outer membrane, right, that it in, was engulfed in. And so now what you have is a mitochondria with still a double layer, but the outer uh, plasma membrane is degraded. And inside too, if you look at a mitochondria, it's just a bunch of membranes. We are going to talk a lot about how those invaginations help it do the work that it does, right, uh, to create all those various compartments um, when we talk about energy production later in the semester. Did that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Okay, so let's talk about how our endomembrane system knows where the protein needs to go, right? So how does it know? How is there an address printed on them? What is it that lets them know how these proteins are gonna move from one place to another? So proteins are imported into these organelles through many, many different ways. There are three main ways that we are going to focus on. 
Um, so the first thing is that as the proteins are built, right, they can be built on free ribosomes that are just hanging out in the cytoplasm or cytosol, or they could be built on the ER on the studded ribosomes. So as if uh, many of the times you will notice that the proteins that are going to be um, housed inside the cytoplasm or the cytosol of the cell are going to be built on these ribosomes that are freely floating inside it. So they go from one place to another very easily. Other times the proteins are going to be built on these um, ribosomes that are studied on ER because they now need to be modified somehow. They need to be organized and moved into a place that they need to do. Now, um, they, one of the things is that some of these proteins that are built in the cytosol will need to still be translocated somewhere else, right? So they could be part of your nucleus. So that means they have to get transported through the nuclear pore into the nucleus. And so they need you need to know how that's gonna happen, right? They could be part of the chloroplast or the mitochondria as well. So while chloroplast and mitochondria make some of their own proteins, they don't make all of them. They are still proteins that are made in cytosol that need to get into those systems as well. And then they could also be going into some of the other organelles like the peroxisome or the lysosome. The other thing is that, um, you know, so when they are going through these specialized membranes, they're going to need a very specialized structure in order to be able to get through the membranes, the membranes of chloroplast or mitochondria that are very different than our general plasma membrane outside. Um, or if they're going into peroxisome, they're going into a very different environment than where they were built and that would need to be taken into account. And then the third way is their transport by vesicles, um, which is through that endomembrane complex that we are going to focus on in a minute. So you can have proteins going to where they need to go through the nuclear pore to get to the nucleus or to get out of the nucleus through membranes, across membranes to get to their final destination in one of the organelles like the chloroplast, mitochondria, peroxisome, or they could be transported by vesicles as part of the endomembrane system. Um, now, what tells the protein or tells the cell where the protein is going to go is a signal sequence. So they do have kind of like an address on them listed so that the cell knows where the protein needs to go. Many times, if the protein is going to be within the cytosol of the cell, it has no signal sequence. So if you are provided, for example, on the test with a protein sequence and told there's no signal sequence, you know it's going to be housed in the cytosol. On the other hand, proteins that are going to be going to another location will have a tag that will tell the cell where it needs to go. So you will have ER signal sequence or secretion signal to let us know that it's going to go outside the cell, get secreted to the outside of the cell, or a nuclear signal to get into the nucleus itself. Those signals are going to be removed once they are read and the protein is going to its final destination. Okay, um, so in a normal case, that's one thing that can happen. The other thing is, let's say that you have a protein that has, an, you know, and this is how we know these work and we, how we know those tags. Um, there were many such tags discovered initially through signal sequence, through study of recombinant DNA, where we noticed that if that tag was mismatched, if we accidentally removed it, the protein was no longer able to get into where it needs to go. And the protein would hang out in the cytosol because there was no signal on it. On the other hand, if we took the same tag and we put it on a protein that is normally housed in the cytosol, then that protein will would go into whatever the tag said, ER or uh, secreted out or in the nucleus, wherever you assign it to based on that tag. I actually did that as part of my PhD project where I had a protein that I had discovered um, secreted into the media under very special conditions in cancer cells where that protein when secreted would cause that cancer cell to die. That's great, right? We want the cancer cell to die. We don't want it to grow and replicate and cause more aggressive tumor. So 
that protein was very well studied as an intracellular protein, as a protein that lives in the cytoplasm, in the mitochondria, and it does important functions there. What I did was I was like, okay, let me take this protein instead of providing the conditions, because I don't know what those conditions exactly are and how to replicate them. I'm just going to put a signal sequence on this protein when I clone it so that it is secreted out into the cell, out of the cell. So I did that. I made my clone. Um, I cloned my, I made the construct where my protein sequence, uh, the mRNA of my protein sequence was merged with a signal sequence. I put it into a cell, into a cancer cell, and lo and behold, it was all going out. Initially, what happened was, though, it was very interesting. So I was doing that. And I would look at the cell. There would be lots of cells the first day. I was like, yay, it's working. I can see that, you know, my uh, system has worked because I also had a GFP tag. So I could look at them with the fluorescence and I could say, okay, it got in. My tag got in or my construct got in. So I look at the first day, lots of cells. They're all glowing green or 80% are glowing green. Great. I come the next day, everyone's dead. I'm like, oh no, I infected myself. I do it again. Same thing. First day, beautiful green signal. I get pictures for my you know, advisor. I show him he's excited. I'm excited. A day later, the next morning I come to check on them. They're all dead. Happened three times. What do you think happened? I hope that wasn't one of the exam questions I gave you. Well, either way. Did your cell like recognize that that's not like a usual signal that's in the cell and destroy it or? No. How did I find it? I told you a second ago how I found it, why I got interested in this. So my PhD project, and I'll tell you one sentence of clue before you answer. My PhD project was to look at signals that are put outside the cell that help the normal cells communicate with the cancer cells and vice versa. So how they're controlling each other. And in doing so, I had found a protein that I saw was killing cancer cells, okay? So that's how I had found it. And I was like, oh, this protein kills cancer cells and I found it in the media. But when I looked in the literature, I saw that it was not normally found in the media or not secreted in outside the cell. So that's why I had built that tag on it. So knowing that, what was going on when I put a signal sequence where all the protein that I made was outside, was sent, shuttled outside the cell. Did it recognize itself as an, an anomaly and it destroyed itself? No, then it would only destroy itself. Why did it kill my cells? Was it because the secreted signal was being trans or communicated across to other cells? No. Nope. So I had put this, uh, you know, this construct inside a cancer cell and I found this protein when I was looking for proteins in the secreted you know, uh, secreted proteins in the media that kill cancer cells. So by putting this in there, I was putting it in there because it was easy to put it in there and to make lots of it. What was happening was this protein was getting secreted and it was killing the cells because that's what it did when it got secreted out. So I couldn't catch it because it killed them. Exactly what it was supposed to do, exactly what I was excited about, why I started studying it but I didn't think it through that time. That's what happened. So then what did I have to do? What do you think I could do to still study it, but not kill my cells all the, before I could study it? You have to deactivate the marker. Say it again. You have to deactivate the marker. I have to deactivate the, mar the signal sequence somehow, right? But I don't want it deactivate it all the time because that's exactly what I want to study as well. So then I actually, and this is something we will again touch base on next set of lectures when we start learning about DNA and how we control and regulate the expression of DNA, um, is that I actually put it under regulation. So it only got activated when I added a particular activator 
molecule to the media. So the cells were fine. I could study my silly protein until I added that molecule to activate its secretion. And then all of it got shuttled out. And what happened to the cell when it got shuttled out? They all died. They all died. Exactly. But that took like three months of me before I was like, oh, shoot, that's what I did. Never mind. So you put something that was supposed to kill cancer cells and it wind up killing, wound up killing everything at the same time. Well, yes. And it, that's what it should have done, but okay. I should have thought that through. I shouldn't have put okay. all of it outside. Like I should have done that regulation to begin with. Right. Yeah. So yes, because we wanted to study that secreted protein. There were a lot of papers on that protein being inside the cell, protecting the cell from death and starvation or whatever there was not any literature or there was very limited literature on what it did outside. And that's what I had found was that cool function that you could use it as a drug to kill the cells, the cancer cells specifically, but I can't study it if I kill the cells before I get them, you know, get the response. So yes. What's so the that's yeah. an example of how you can use this technology. You can use this information to develop really cool uh, experiments to study function of your proteins under various conditions, under various settings, under various, you know, environmental conditions or under various uh, localizations within the cell. Okay. Okay. So here are a few of those signals that we know um, are very well studied and are, uh, you know, categorized very well. So the ones that are in here, um, actually the signal sequence for secretion is not on this chart, but if I were to give you an exam question on it, I would provide you with that sequence. Same thing for any one of these. So I would remind you what that signal sequence is if I'm asking you to look for it. Um, so these are some of the signals um, that we know exist and are used all the time by ourselves. They are specific sequences that are used to import, to target proteins to get imported into the ER itself. Then there are others that are used to retain them in the lumen of the ER. Lumen of the ER refers to the inside of your endoplasmic reticulum. All, and you will notice as we go uh, talk more about uh, these systems today, that many times the internal environments of the Endoplas you know, the endomembrane system are considered similar to extracellular space by our cells themselves. So anytime, that's why when we talked about lipid membranes, if you remember, um, the membranes are different on the two sides, right? They are not the same. And the lumen was where the extracellular side of the lipid was hanging out, right? Because that's what's mimicking the same environment as what's on the outside. So proteins, many times, if they are going to be secreted outside and need to be modified first, um, they will be retained in the lumen of the ER. And that would be the signal for that. Um, there's another signal that tells us when proteins are going to be important into the mitochondria that contains a lot of arginines and lysine residues at a very specific spaces in a pattern. Um, and then for import into nucleus, you will have usually the lysines and arginines in a long line um, together uh, to uh, use that as a tag for movement into nucleus. So these essentially are the addresses, right, that you need for the cell to recognize where the protein needs to go, how the ne protein needs to move inside the cell to get to the final place. Now, all these signals will have the amino terminal on the carboxy terminal, if, uh, the amino terminal listed if they are at the beginning of the uh, polypeptide chain and the carboxy terminal listed if they are at the end of the polypeptide chain. So the same protein, right, is going to, if a protein is going to be uh, importing into the ER and then retained, will contain this sequence at the amino terminal and will contain this sequence at the carboxy terminal. So the ER will grab onto it when it recognizes the sequence, will start to import it 
until it reaches a carboxy terminal when it receives the second signal where it will say, okay, you're going to hang out here until further notice, until whatever needs to be done to you. Does that make sense? Can you point out really quick what the amino terminal so is? The amino terminal what? is right here. You'll see that as NH3 plus and CO okay. minus is the carboxy terminal. So well, the I amino, I'm sorry. Yes. Will the amino terminal, will the uh, H, NH3 change or is that like constant throughout? No, that's going to be constant. So it's okay. also going to be listed as NH3 plus. Okay, cool. Thank you. So yeah, so important to the ER, important to mitochondria, right? Those two both have that amino terminal listed in the beginning. That's because those signals are in the beginning. The signal sequence for secretion is also in the beginning, by the way. Um, so it will also have that NH3. And then you'll usually see the methionine, obviously, and then the rest of the stuff. The carboxy terminal is going to be indicating the end of the polypeptide chain, okay? Now, some of these, as you notice, they don't have the carboxy or the amino terminal listed. That's because they are already going to be in that final 3D tertiary structure, right? And so their signals may not be at the beginning or the end. They, it will be at location that is going to interact with those particular uh, spaces as they're moving through that space. That's why they won't have the amino and the carboxy terminal listed there because they may not be at the beginning or end. They don't have to be there. Okay. So I'm trying to make the screen work, which doesn't work anymore because I also cracked my computer screen. It's a very sad computer this last year. Okay. Sorry, so if they don't have the amino or the car the carboxyl attachment to it, it's fine. It's already there. Well, it exists somewhere in the polypeptide chain. It's just telling okay. you when there is no amino and carboxy terminal listed on the signal sequence, that's just telling you that it can be present anywhere throughout that chain. It doesn't have to be in the beginning or end. For import into the, uh, into the ER, it has to be at the beginning of the polypeptide chain. For the, car, uh, you know, retention in lumen, it has to be at the end of the polypeptide chain. But um, some of these, they don't need to be in the beginning or end. They These sequences could be present anywhere for the cell to recognize it as that tag because these would already be in their tertiary form. So they may have, you know, the, in the tertiary form, you don't have to have the ends uh, hanging out outside. They may be inside and whatever area is going to interact with the nucleus or interact with the peroxisome is what's going to contain the tag. Okay. Thank you. And the other thing with these is that not all of these se sequences get cleaved off. Some sequences will get cleaved off once recognized and used. Others remain there because those proteins may be shuttling in and out many times. You can imagine that for a protein that's going to go in and out of the nucleus when it's activated. If it removes the tag, how's it going to go? It won't work the next time. So those signals always, they are kind of almost like an active site at that point, right? It, it, in theory, like you can imagine that it's the same idea, that it's a sequence that it's going to, you know, touch and recognize so that it moves into the cell and then get exported out of the cell or nucleus or wherever it is that it needs to go again and again to do the work it needs to do. Okay. Okay, so let's go now to how uh, we're going to start looking at how uh, these different membranes are different uh, from each other and how they control movement of molecules in and out of the cell. And we're going to start off by looking at the most complex of them in a way. Well, they're all complex in their own way, but one of the uh, more different one, um, and that's the nuclear envelope. And that's different because it has those two, it's a double bilayer, right? So it's essentially four molecules, uh, four layers of lipids uh, protecting that inside of the nuclear uh, space. And those are going to, as we talked about, the majority of the molecules that are going to go in and out of that tightly regulated space 
are going to be through this nuclear pore. The nuclear pores are a very specific structure and these structures go through, they are, you know, passing through the both bilayers to create little gates um, that will allow materials to enter or exit that space as needed. Now within that space, if you look internally to the structure, you will see that it contains the lipid, um, the lipids actually inside as well. So it has hydrophobic areas as well as proteins or cytosolic fibrils that are connecting to it to create almost like a basket structure. It's kind of like a basketball where things can go in and then it interact with other stuff to open up to release their contents. Um, so on the outside, the gate essentially is controlled by the cytosolic protein uh, structural fibrils that are going to control when it's open or close. And then on the inner side, um, there are going to be proteins, the nuclear pore proteins, complex proteins that are going to contain it in its right conformation. Inside the nucleus, you also have a nuclear lamina uh, underneath the inner nuclear membrane that's containing the nuclear in its appropriate structure and space, providing the space for all the DNA, the chromatin to latch onto, to combine, uh, to attach to, okay? And so a lot of macromolecules, including proteins, are going to go through these nuclear pores as needed to do the work they need to do inside the cell. Okay. So within this, what's important to know is that the nuclear pores are going to pass through both the membranes of the nucleus. Um, they contain both hydrophobic and hydrophilic uh, interaction spaces. So both types of molecules can go in and out depending upon what is needed there. Um, and they create a basket-like structure with the combination of the lipid tails as well as structural proteins and nuclear pore complex proteins to contain molecules and release them as needed into the um, nucleus itself. A lot of the movement of molecules will be dependent on diffusion as well. So macromolecules especially can diffuse through these pores as needed according to the concentration gradient as you have your you know, transcription going on or some other uh, system going on. I'm sorry, apparently the yard guys are coming in, making noise. Do you guys hear them in the back? Very or you're good. Yes. Yeah, only a little. It's not only bad. I can't hear you anymore though. So <laughs> I might wanna look at that. Ooh. I just noticed that there are some things in the chat. C O O. I'm sorry, the chat was kind of hiding in the back, so I didn't see it. Um, yeah, so the protein, um, Vivian, you asked a question earlier about the protein that I was working with. The protein, when it's inside the cell, actually protects the cell from apoptosis. It, binds to proteins in the mitochondria and protects the cell. So they don't undergo apoptosis. One of the ways that it controls that system is when it shuttles out, that protection is gone. So some cancer cells will just die now because that protein got shuttled out. In other cases, it actually binds to receptors on the cell surface as well and it, uh, start a death response as well. So there are two different ways that it can induce uh, the death of cancer cells. Okay, so now let's look at how, so we talked about how macromolecules will just go through diffusion as needed in there, but what about actual proteins, right? They have to get through too. How are they going to get through? So now in the case of um, the actual proteins, it depends on what type of protein is getting through. Again, in some cases, uh, it's going to involve uh, interaction with a nuclear import signal before it can uh, go in or out of that cell. Uh, so let's say that you have a nuclear protein that needs to go into the cell. It's going to be first recognized by the existence of a nuclear localization signal, right? Like we talked about, it's going to have a signal on it, some kind of a tag on it that tells the cell that this is a protein that needs to get into this nucleus. Now, how does the cell know that? 
it knows that because there are other proteins. They are called nuclear import receptors. Um, these are specific proteins that can bind to that signal. That's their active site recognizes this, that that's their ligand, they bind to it. And that binding now is what makes that protein go into interact with the cytosolic fibrils. The nuclear protein, even though it has that signal, will not bind the cytosolic fibrils or interact with the nuclear pore unless it binds to the nuclear import receptor first. That binding is what allows it to get into the nuclear pore and uh, interact with it in appropriate way. Now, um, so the nuclear import receptor is the same, no matter, you know, there are there may be hundreds of proteins that need to get into the um, nucleus for all of them. Instead of, you know, if the nuclear pore had to design specific binding sites for all of them, that would be almost next to impossible. So by having this one constant, which is the nuclear import receptor, it cleans that system up, right? So anytime there's a nuclear signal, um, localization signal come, uh, for the nucleus, this nuclear import receptor can bind to it. When it binds to it, that binding is then allowing it to interact with the nuclear pore itself because the nuclear pore has the binding affinity for this receptor itself. So that receptor is going to interact with actually the hydrophobic areas of that nuclear pore and allow that protein to then be released into the nucleus. When the protein is, uh, brought into the nucleus. I can't move my, sorry, my mouse for a second. Um, that interaction is going, that movement into the nucleus now brings it back into that aqueous environment of the nucleus where that binding is no longer um, strong and the protein will get separated away. The nuclear import protein will get separated away and it's now free to do this whole cycle all over again. Now this protein is run through GTP hydrolysis. So we talked about the tRNA last time, um, how that works through GTP hydrolysis. This one also works the same way. So the GTP is hydrolyzed in the process where you know you, it uses the energy from that phosphate to dissociate the protein from the receptor and move it into the nucleus um, through the nuclear pore. So here, you know, is a protein that has already bound to that uh, signal, the localization through the localization, right? Signal um, to the receptor. It will then go through the nuclear pore that doesn't require any energy input. And now when it gets out uh, into the nuclear pore, it's going to bind to its GTP receptor, which will allow this protein to get freed up into the nucleus where it needs to be and the actual import receptor to move out of the nuclear pore uh, because now it no longer has that protein on it. The next cycle, again, it will use the phosphate from the GTP and um, which will release the GDP. That process will lead to a binding of the nuclear protein to the nuclear receptor and then start the cycle all over again. Does that process make sense? Yes. Okay. Good. Okay. So the GTP hydrolyzed, hydrolyzed twice, once when it uh, like bind to the receptor, then when- No, it, it only hydrolyzed once. So it's the, receptor is normally found in the cytosol bound to the GTP. When it binds to the nuclear localization signal in a prospective protein, it does that through phosphorylation, you know, through hydrolysis of that GTP molecule. So it uh, dephosphorylates, it so, you know, it uh, hydrolyzes the GTP, leads to the phosphate getting com uh, coming off, that also releases the GDP from it. And now it's free to bind to this nuclear signal. It binds to the signal. When it goes in, it doesn't need any more GTP hydrolysis. 
but to get back out, it needs to bind to a new GTP molecule so that it goes back into its kind of so-called um, cytosolic conformation, right? Otherwise, as a free molecule, it will just hang out inside. We don't want it inside. We want it outside in the cytosol where it can bind to more molecules. So to get out of the pore, it needs to bind to another GTP molecule. It's not using it, it just bound to it. It changes its conformation to get out of the cell, out of the nucleus, sorry. And then in the nucleus, it will hang out until it needs to bind to another nuclear uh, protein again. Um, so the only time it hydrolyzes GTP is when it swaps the GTP for the nuclear protein. Okay? Yes, and like the the receptor, the import receptor, like will diffuse from the pore by only by diffusion get with yeah, the that can easily the receptor itself can easily go in and out of the pore. It depends on its conformation whether it is going in versus out. So when it's bound to GTP, it will automatically go out. When it's bound to a protein, it will move it in. Okay? Okay, that makes sense. Okay. Um, I did have one question on the process. Yes. Is it almost like a simultaneous when it does the release of that phosphate and the attachment of that yes. nuclear? Mm-hmm. Okay, thank and it's you. usually, you know, of course, in this picture, they show them like far apart. It's usually because there was a nuclear signal, localization signal kind of recognized that causes that phosphate, uh, that hydrolysis to occur so that that binding can happen. And is that through um, the processes of like a polarization of a sorts or how? So is it would be through those side chains that are present in that no nuclear localization signal. So you may my chat keeps moving instead of this. If you look at the nuclear signal and you look at the string of pro, you know, amino acids, right? What type of amino acids are these? That can give you a clue as to what type of interaction they'll be, right? So does anyone know? It depends on the polarity. Yes. So that's kind of what it's doing, right? It's a string of lysines and arginines, right? That are all having the same kind of charge group. So that's going to create that pocket that will allow for this interaction to occur. So that's why every single nuclear protein is always going to have this signal on it. I do have a question about the receptor. Are the receptors like um, protein specific? Are the receptors like what, what specific? Protein specific. No, the receptors don't need to be protein specific because they're signal specific. And any protein that needs to go into the nucleus will have the same signal, which is always this three lysine and arginine and a lysine in a row. So that sequence is what's um, recognized by the receptor as a nuclear import signal. So any protein that can show that signal, you know, that sequence to the receptor will get moved into the nucleus. Okay, that makes sense. Okay, so that's why, that's what I was talking about, that if you were to make it protein specific, can you imagine the diversity you would need to catch everything? that would be way too much for it to. So, you know, our cells work smart. They don't work hard or they try at least not to work hard. They try to work smart always. So this allows them to work smart because there's a specific sequence that it's recognizing anytime that it's a protein that needs to go into the nucleus. So think of that little, you know, the lysines and arginine as the little uh, pocket that the protein is protruding as a, you know, ligand binding right area that or ligand that can then bind to the receptor in its pocket associated with it okay yes no maybe 
Yes, thank you. That makes more sense for okay. me. Okay. Okay. okay, cool. How are we on time? Anyone know the time? I well, wish you see. So we still have like 25 minutes. Perfect. Good 15, job. Actually. 15. <laughs> oh, my bad. I can't do math. Apparently, okay, well, 25 was nice there, but okay, I guess we're going to deal with 15 then. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, let's see where we get then. Uh, so yeah, so the prospective nuclear proteins are going to, again, remember that they're going to move through, they're going to get imported from the cytosol through the nuclear pores with the help of the nuclear import receptor, which is going to be working through the GTP hydrolysis. So that's another example of a GTP hydrolysis uh, protein. Okay. Now, what happens, let's go to a different location and now look at another place where proteins need to go in and out all the time, and that's in mitochondrial chloroplast. Again, this is an example of another place where you will have double membranes. You have outer mitochondrial membrane and inner mitochondrial membrane. Similarly, in the chloroplast, you'll also have outer and inner uh, membranes in there as well. And the environments in each one of these spaces is going to be very different. The membranes are different and the internal environments created in those compartments are different as well. In these, the, in these places, actually the proteins have to, they can't just go through like they could with the help of a nuclear pore um, the way they are. They actually have to unfold completely into their primary structure and then get translocated into the inner membrane. And this happens again with the help of a se signal sequence that's present on your polypeptide chain that targets it to the mitochondria or the chloroplast. That signal sequence is again going to be recognized by an import receptor protein in this case. So, um, you know, just like you had a nuclear re import receptor, you have an import receptor for mitochondrial membrane and for uh, mitochondria or for chloroplast as well. Now, these proteins are um, different than the ones that we read about earlier in the nucleus. In the nucleus, um, your import protein was hanging out in the cytosol, running through GTP hydrolysis. In this case, they are actually a receptor on the surface on the outer mitochondrial membrane or outer chloroplast membrane. The signal sequence is recognized as a tag um, as a binding place on that receptor, and that allows it to move through into the actual um, mitochondrial space. So here is the receptor that is bound uh, to the membrane. Uh, the signal sequence is getting recognized on that receptor, right? It receives it as a signal. Um, that receptor, the import receptor protein is in combination, so remember, we looked at a lot of different types of proteins that interact in the plasma membrane. Some proteins are bound to each other together to work, form a working complex. This is an example of that. You have a protein translocator that is right adjacent to it and uh, will receive that protein once it is recognized and bound to the receptor. So that will allow that protein to start moving into the mitochondria. Once into this first intermembrane uh, space, it's going to then have a second translocator that will again recognize the signal sequence, which will cause it to come in close contact with the outer membrane translocator, and then will move it further into the inner mitochondrial space. Um, now, if that protein was going to hang out in a different space in the mitochondria, it will just go there, right? But if it is going all the way into the matrix, that's how it's translocating. It's binding to an import receptor that recognizes the signal sequence that then transfers it into the protein translocator. In the outer membrane, it goes into the intermembrane space where it then um, binds again to the second signal uh, to a second translocator protein in the inner membrane that will then move it into the matrix. Now, as it starts moving into the final uh, matrix, it's going to start folding up into its back into its original shape that it was the tertiary structure that it was supposed to be in. 
And once it is fully folded, the last part to mature protein, actual active protein, would be the cleavage of the signal. So once it's here, it's not going back out. It's stuck in here. Unlike the other proteins, which could go back out, uh, shuttle in and out as needed. So these proteins are going to remain inside uh, for good. Okay. Really so quick. I, say it again. Really quick. That import receptor protein. Yes. What's its main goal? Does it take the protein and transfer it to the protein translocator? It recognizes the signal sequence. The others okay. don't have a way to recognize the signal sequence as such, right? So they recognize yeah. the signal sequence and it moves it into the translocator. That's its cool. total goal. Cool. Then everything else is just transferring. The translocators, all they're doing is just threading it through and moving it in. Awesome. Thank you. Okay. Hi, sorry about that. So yeah. it will only move through the translocator membrane um, until after the import receptor protein says it's okay. Until after the, say it again. Sorry. I love so, it. Uh, sorry. So the protein will only start moving through the, um, translocator proteins. So the yellow one and the orange one until the import receptor protein, the green one says it's okay. So it can't even move through, um, the translocator. Yeah. It can't go through translocator without import receptor protein first binding to it and telling it it's okay to get it. Okay, awesome. Thank you. Okay. Okay. So now going further into the endoplasmic reticulum, um, the ER is our most extensive network, right? That's taking over, uh, you know, it's multiple times the surface area of the plasma membrane through these inner channels, kind of like our intestines, right? Where they just create this big uh, kind of network of membranes and intermembrane spaces for ourselves to do our work. Um, and those here, right here, you can see examples of rough ER, which are studded with the ribosomes, all synthesizing proteins that are going to go into this endoplasmic reticulum to get modified, to get packaged, to get moved to the next space. Um, now we are going to go into how that process works. So proteins are translated by the ribosomes, a process we'll study in the next section of our uh, class. And as they are uh, translated, uh, you know, and made into these polypeptide chains, those polypeptide chains, if they are free in the cytosol, will just produce the polypeptide chain, it will go back into its, you know, it will make its tertiary structure and go do its thing. But if it is part of your membrane bound ribosomal cycle, it is going to be, the ribosome is gonna be bound to an actual pore on a protein translocator rather, not a pore, but a protein translocator on the actual uh, ER um, surface, ER membrane. And as that protein is getting built, right? As that protein polypeptide chain is getting translated, it is going to first start off with that signal that's going to be recognized by that uh, translocator. And in this case, the translocator not only recognized that polypeptide chain uh, as something going in, but also moves it in as it goes. Now, that signal remains bound to that translocator until the entire polypeptide chain has been translated and moved. Okay, so once that um, is finished, only then does that uh, binding get taken off. So how does it do it? Well, it does it again through a specific signal that is telling it to move in. And it is recognized by a signal recognition particle in this case. So your mRNA, which is getting changed into, translated into your polypeptide chain through the ribosome, is going to, um, you know, the signal recognition particle will come bind to that signal that translocates it, that tells that it needs to go into the ER. It will then cause that once it binds to this um, ER signal, it is going to then bind to a SRP receptor. So this one actually has two levels of control in a way, right? So it's not just a single recognition of that signal, but it's 
a, a actual recognition particle that's binding to the signal and then that signal recognition particle binding to a receptor that activates this whole response once that um, signal uh, recognition particle translocates that and puts it into the receptor into the protein translocator then it gets displaced and released for reuse. It's gonna keep on doing this. It's always gonna to bind to the signal for the ER. It's going to move it to the receptor, which will then move it into the translocator, which will then move the actual polypeptide chain into the ER lumen, okay? So the translocators in general, they are not the ones recognizing the signal. They are holding it in place once it's there, but it is not the one that recognized that it was an ER specific signal. It was a signal recognition particle that recognized that signal and it brought it to the proximity of that translocator through its interaction with the SRP receptor, okay? Um, and so as these proteins are getting built, obviously they, like I said, it's going to keep that signal in place in that translocator until the entire polypeptide chain has been built, at which point there is a peptidase that's right there. It's a signal peptidase that's right there next to your um, a translocator that will cleave that signal and release the polypeptide chain without the signal on it. That cleaved signal will remain in that space until it is removed from there later on. Okay, so the cleave signal peptide actually hangs out in the ER plasma membrane itself. So this uh, is an example of when it's starting the signal, right? Now, remember, we also talked about there are signals that tell the ER membrane when to stop the signal, from stop the movement of a particular protein. So here is an example of that. You may have a protein uh, that is built that needs to be part, for example, it's a transmembrane protein that needs to hang out in the ER. That's where it does its work. That's where it needs to stay. In that case, the protein may be built in the cytosol. Again, it's going to be recognized through the ER signal sequence on the amino terminal into the, term, uh, into the protein translocator. That's how it will get fed into the translocator it will stay bound, the signal sequence will stay bound to the translocator until it reaches a hydrophobic stop sequence, at which point the peptidase will cleave the start of your, uh, the start signal sequence. Now this protein is embedded into the membrane the way it needs to be. Um, the amino terminal is free to make its final tertiary structure. And similarly, your carboxy terminal is coming out and doing what it needs to do to create its tertiary structure. And this orange section, which is the stop sequence built up of the hydrophobic amino acid residues is going to be what's holding it in that membrane in place. So that would be an example of a start stop sequence where a protein that needs to be embedded within the ER, integrated into the ER membrane, um, gets there through this process okay what that happens what happens to the protein translocator does it move yeah or does the it just translocator can move because lipid bilayers are fluid okay so it's just gonna go away yeah cool thank you and similarly actually even the protein can move right so this was an example of a single pass membrane now, sometimes you have membranes that are multi-pass membranes. So you can imagine a set of sequences that control that movement. So you'll still have a single start sequence, but your stop sequences may be arranged in a different way to control how uh, this protein is going to go in and out of that membrane space, okay? Okay. So the third thing, the third transport system that we are going to be talking about, uh, I thought there was, I did, didn't I have a double, okay, so there it is. There you go. That's what I was looking for. It's like I thought I had a double pass membrane system in here somewhere. There it is. 
So in a double pass membrane, you have the signal in a way that it is going to can it is going to be a little bit different than your typical start sequence. It's going to be a start transfer sequence where there are other amino acids in play that contain that particular signal as part of your membrane space. And then you'll have, again, the stop sequence when it needs to be stopped. If you had a multi-pass membrane, you will have this same sequence, the same start sequence appearing two or three times before the final stop sequence occurs, which is the signal to break that chain uh, up away from it, break the translocator away and fix the final form. Okay, so the same sequence can appear multiple times to cause a multi-pass uh, transmembrane protein until you get to this orange specific stop sequence uh, to remove the translocator away from there. Okay, so now we get to the third way that things are going to move in. So the first was the nuclear pore. The second was through this transmembrane uh, through the ER. They're going across the membranes and in the mitochondria going across the membranes with the help of these translocators and signal recognition. The third way um, items move from one place to another. And I see that we are almost out of time. I'm just going to go through the vesicular transport because that is important part for you to know for exam and then we'll stop. Um, and in the vesicular transport, what we are going to look at is how molecules small and large are moved from one place to another in the cell with the help of vesicles. Um, so these vesicles allow materials to both exit the cell as well as enter the cell. So you can have molecules accumulating at the plasma membrane where they then get engulfed in that plasma membrane and brought into the cell. Similarly, and that uh, is what we call endocytosis. Similarly, you can have molecules that are inside the cell, including proteins or lipids, whatever the case may be, that are engulfed in that uh, Golgi complex membrane into endosomes and then finally released, uh, you know, they merge with the plasma membrane and release the contents outside the cell. And that process is called exocytosis, to send it out of the cell, endocytosis to bring the stuff into the cell. So, for our vesicular transport, uh, that is the main way that we move small molecules and proteins, um, especially secreted proteins, uh, signals outside the cell. That's how we communicate with the outside environment. The cells communicate with the outside environment. Now, those are going to have a particular path in which they go. For your exocytosis, you have your endoplasmic reticulum that's going to bud off small vesicles containing the proteins, lipids, membranes, whatever it needs to move um, off the endoplasmic space. Now, remember the lumen is going to behave like the extracellular environment. So that's why the proteins can hang out there completely fine because that's similar to where they're gonna end up. And that these vesicles are then gonna merge into your Golgi apparatus where they sometimes get further modified or sometimes to just kind of move through those membrane stacks until they bud off again um, to go to the plasma membrane. These uh, proteins will always keep, the lipids and the proteins will always keep their orientation as they move through because they were already organized in their appropriate environment originally in the endoplasmic reticulum. Once they move from one stack to the other, again, using vesicular transport, these are small vesicles that are budding off from one space to another, depending on how much modification they need to happen as they move through. At the end of this journey, they are then going to be made into either transport vesicles that are going to take them out to the outer environment or into endosomes that may then get them um, into the cell through endosomes. If there's something that was found wrong, maybe the protein didn't fold properly, maybe there was some problem, they would be and get uh, changed into these endosomes that will then go march into the lysosome for degradation by the lysosomal system. In the case of exocytosis, if everything is good, the transport vesicle will go and merge into the plasma membrane and release the contents outside the cell into the extracellular space.
another way that endocytosis works. So one way of endocytosis is simply the movement of these, you know, uh, things that need to be recycled into endosomes that then merge into lysosome. Others is when there is material taken from outside the cell into uh, the cell by cytosol by invagination of the plasma membrane. These are what we call early uh, endosomes. They change in the way they are structured and in their environment as they start to sort out the material inside. And then the late endosomes many times will contain a lot of vacuoles as well that will then merge into the lysosome for degradation again. So here is an example of how the system looks like at work in real life. One of the molecules that we see in these vesicles is very similar looking to the nuclear pore. It's called clathrin, and clathrin forms these kind of basket-like cages that help to keep molecules in place, um, you know, help shape these vesicles and membranes in place the way they need to. Um, these vesicles then bud off from one place to another according to the environment. So here is an example of clathrin, uh, you know, making that structure very similar to what we saw in those baskets. It reminds me of that, you know, it almost looks like a soccer ball structure. So clathrin is a protein that can coat these vesicles and keep them in the right orientation, in the right environment so that they don't change the orientation of their membranes or the contents, and they maintain that as they get to the extracellular space. Once they reach at the end of their journey to the plasma membrane, the clathrin molecules will get removed as it merges into the uh, plasma membrane to release its contents and keep that uh, condition in space, right? Uh, so you see that you have your actual cargo, the proteins, the receptors, the lipids, whatever that may be. There's a protein called adaptin that binds to the receptors, specific receptors inside the plasma membrane of that uh, Golgi or the ER, whatever that place may be. And then you have the clathrin, which are the larger molecules that bind on top of the adaptin and link with each other to form these um, vesicles that can then move through. Uh, there are specific proteins that act to cleave the receptors or pinch them off. They are called dynamin. And these will then form the vesicles that will then get moved around. Now, this similar, you know, knowing these structures have allowed to us to develop nanoparticles and uh, allow particles that can then move our um, move drugs into and out of the cell as well in uh, nowadays in our uh, systems. Okay, I'm going to stop here. I know if some of you have class at 12.15. Now for the exam, I will add a little bit more, um, you know, so what we are left with is this phagocytosis is not going to be covered in the exam. I do have a little bit of the endocytosis. I know that I have that in there. So I'm going to add a 15 minute lecture probably online as a Canvas Studio video for you to observe along with this so that you are up to speed on that. But majority of your exam is gonna be what we covered up till now in class and what we've already done from before, okay? Everyone good? So for the exam on Thursday, mm -hmm. um, starts at 12, right? So the exam at th for Thursday, it's open for 24 hours. So it will open Tuesday, uh, no, Wednesday night at midnight, and it will stay open till Thursday night at midnight. If you notice, I still have a Zoom uh, meeting scheduled that day. It's so I'll be available during that time if you're running into a problem, if you are having a question that you want to touch base with me on. Okay? Okay. All right. Thank you. No problem. And we don't use our, like, notes and stuff on the exam is closed notes it is closed notes um it's don't go on different sites um but yeah you should be able to i think you should be able to do it without the notes we'll see how you do on the first exam before i decide for the other and for... in the lab many times you'll see my exams are open book open notes but for lectures i like to get you guys to think on your own uh-huh um and for uh the uh the software that we need to download um 
it said access denied on both Chrome and Safari for me. Yeah, I'm about to right okay. after this, I'm going to go check that out and I'm, I'm going to see what's going on with that. So I'll send an announcement uh, update for that. Okay.